A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, what more should I say? I had no time to tell you Gideon, Barak, Samson, Shephrahai, of David and Samuel and all the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, did what was righteous, obtained the promises, they closed the mouths of lions, put out raging fires, escaped the devouring sword, out of weakness they were made powerful, became strong in battle, and turned back foreign invaders. Women received back their death through resurrection. Some were tortured and will not accept deliverance in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others endure mockery, scourging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sought in two, put to death at source point. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, needy, afflicted, tormented. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered about in the desert and on mountains, in caves and all other different places of the earth. Yet all these, though approved because of their faith, did not receive what had been promised. God has foreseen something better for us, so that without us they should not be made perfect. The word of the Lord. Let your hearts take comfort, all who hope in the Lord. How great is the goodness, O Lord, which you have shown for those who love you, and which and towards those who take refuge in you, you show in the sight of the children of men. You hide them in the shelter of your presence from the plotting of men. He screened them within about from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, whose wondrous mercy he has shown me in a fortified city. Once I said in my anguish, I am cut off from your sight, Yet you heard the sound of my pleading when I cry out to you. Love the Lord, all you his faithful ones. The Lord keep those who are constant, but more than requ requites those who act proudly. Dominus Fobiscum, Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum, Jesus and his disciples came to the other side of the sea, to the territory of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, at once, a man from the tombs who had, 
an unclean spirit met him. The man had been dwelling among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any longer, even with a chain. In fact, he had frequently been bound with shackles and chains, but the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles smashed, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the hillsides, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and prostrated himself before him, crying out in a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. He had been saying to him, unclean spirit, come out of the man. He asked him, what is your name? He replied, legion is my name. There are many of us. And he pleaded earnestly with him, not to drive them away from that territory. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they pleaded with him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. And he let them, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down a steep bank into the sea, where they were drowned. The swineherds ran away and reported the incident in the town and throughout the countryside. And people came out to see what had happened. As they approached Jesus, they caught sight of the man who had been possessed by legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And they were seized with fear. Those who witnessed the incident explained to them what had happened to the possessed man and to the swine. Then they began to beg him to leave their district. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed pleaded to remain with him. But Jesus would not permit him, but told him instead, go home to your family and announce to them all the Lord in his pity has done for you. Then the man went off and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what God had done for him, and all were amazed. Verbum Domini. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the following article appeared in a Catholic newspaper about 15 years ago. The homily in my parish church the other morning was about the nature of Christ, and the associate pastor was doing his best to make Jesus look good, but it seemed it wasn't easy. In the short gospel reading, Christ quotes a psalm, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. The problem, the priest told the 15 or so mostly older mass goers, was that Jesus was mixed up in his use of this particular piece of scripture. Jesus, in fact, had misinterpreted the psalm he quoted, an idea that many at the mass surely were hearing for the first time in their lives. But he didn't spell out exactly how Jesus had gotten it wrong. When I ran into the priest a few days later, I told him I hadn't understood his sermon about Christ misinterpreting scripture. Well, he did, he said matter-of-factly. But doesn't that raise some problems, I asked. If Christ could be wrong in this teaching, could he have been wrong about a lot of other things? The priest shrugged and extended his hands outward, palms up, in the classic who knows gesture. You gotta remember, he said, Jesus, didn't have the benefit of the same religious education that we have today with all the things that modern scholarship brings us. 
If the homily itself had been eyebrow raising, the explanation was breathtaking in itself confidence and condescension toward Jesus as a poor fellow who hadn't been lucky enough to go to the seminary in the 1990s. If only Jesus were here today, you got the impression that this priest at least would be only too happy to straighten him out. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Pope has asked us this year to celebrate a year of faith. The cornerstone of our faith is our faith in Jesus. And this is not an isolated incident. The Pope himself, when he was head of the Congregation of the Doctor of the Faith, in 1989 gave a talk, an address, to bishops and theologians in Europe. Among other things, he explained in this talk that the Catholic faith was in deep, serious trouble on its ideas about the nature of Christ. He said today people had a tendency, and this is of course in 1989, it's changed a little since then, to reduce Jesus either to a Marxist revolutionary who was leading armed struggle against unjust social structures, or something that we have more difficulty with in our country, a person who was just a nice man, so good as somehow to be identified with God, who preached a simple doctrine of love and pacifism and struggled against too much legalism in the world. In other words, the image of the new Christianity is that you take the crucifix and instead of Jesus' dying body on the cross, you put a California happy face on it. And instead of I and our I, you write nice on the top. Jesus just helps us to feel good about ourselves and be nice. Now the readings today stand in direct opposition to this problem today we have in demoting Christ and his divinity in order to emphasize his humanity. And while there's no problem with emphasizing Jesus' humanity, we have to realize that he is the person of the word of God made flesh. In fact, all of time and all of space and all of history are changed because of him. We can see this in the first reading from the Epistle of the Hebrews, which begins actually in this chapter 11, where Paul says that in order to be saved, you have to believe two things. First, that God exists, and secondly, that he rewards good and punishes evil. People all throughout the history of the world had implicit faith after the sin, because Adam and Eve had a rather settled faith, but after the sin, of course, we lost grace, we lost faith, and we had to recover it. Slowly but surely, the human race began to develop the need for God again, but at a certain point in time, God intervened to reveal his nature to us on Mount Sinai, and of course, in Genesis 3.15, he promises the Redeemer. People had implicit faith in this as they went along. The Jews, more explicit than the rest of the human race. And we can see this by the fact that the Jews were saved by their faith in the future Messiah. Who are all these people that Paul mentions here? Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, whom he says conquered kingdoms, etc., etc. All these people were members of Israel. They endured mockery, scourging, the world was not worthy of them. In other words, he goes through all the saints of the Old Testament. But then he says at the end, all these, though approved because of their faith, did not foresee, receive what had been promised because God had foreseen something better for us so that without us, they should not be perfect. What they looked forward to, namely the coming of Christ, as the prime revealer and prime revelation of God, we, happy we, have received in its fullness. And this revelation teaches us that our Lord is a unique mediator between God and man. In the year 2000, when we celebrated the 2000th anniversary of his birth, which basically cuts time in two, between before Christ and after Christ, not common era, please, and before common era, Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, the Pope wrote a letter in which he explained that because Jesus was the Word made flesh, that he was the unique mediator between God and man. And oddly, some Catholic theologians were horrified at this. 
Well, what about Moses and Muhammad and Buddha and all these people? No, 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 they're not the word of God made flesh. Jesus is. And you can see his power in his human flesh by the fact that in the gospel passage today, in the Gerasene demoniac, we have Christ performing an exorcism. And not an exorcism in someone else's name. He personally performs it. And interestingly enough, now, you know, I'm a Dominican from California. I studied theology at Berserkley, that's Berkeley to you people. From 1967 to 1973, I survived the 60s. But a very interesting thing when I studied scripture in the Synoptic Gospels was we were taught that the first people, first persons, to confess Jesus were the demons. And we actually had a whole question, I remember on a final exam, about the demons confessing Christ in these Gospels. This Gerasene demoniac, who's totally disordered in himself, who can't experience unity at all in his personality, even with his actions, so much so that he can't be bound, when he sees Jesus, he comes up and he says, my name is Legion and we are many. The devil seeks to divide us within. When we sinned and lost grace, when we look forward in faith to our Redeemer, we did this primarily because we experienced the fact that as Paul says in Romans, the good I want to do I don't do and the evil I don't want to do I do. Oh, unhappy man am I, who will free me from this body of death? Because our emotions go in one way, our intellect goes in another way, our will goes in another way, and we experience ourselves as the divided city. Satan wishes to divide us. He wishes to divide us exteriorly, it's true, from each other, but the source of our exterior division is within. It's due to the loss of grace in the original sin, and it's within our very character itself that we need to be redeemed. When Satan says, my name is Legion, and remember, a Roman legion has 6,000 people in it, it shows that the kingdom of Dis, as Dante called it in the Inferno, this kingdom divides us from ourselves because we're divided from God and it divides us from each other. Jesus wishes to bring us back to faith in God. He does not have faith. You will never find faith attributed to Christ because he has the vision of God from the moment of his conception. But he gives faith to us because our response to revelation First of all, the revelation of the Old Testament that all these saints believed in, but now the fullness of revelation in God is our faith in him. In the New Translation for the Creed, we say he's consubstantial with the Father. Lots and lots of people said, well, that's too hard a word. Why do we use that word? Wasn't one in being enough? No, it wasn't. I'm one in being with God through grace, but I'm not the same as the Son of God. I'm not the Word made flesh. And that word, consubstantial, 200 years people fought over that word and died over it. It's a very important word because it demonstrates that Christ, the person of the word with a divine nature, at a certain point in time, took unto himself a human nature so that in his human nature he might drive out the demons, send them into the swine, and return the man to the unity of character. And dear brothers and sisters, in our salvation, he wishes to do so for us. But we can only do this if we persevere in our faith, and our faith has to be one. As soon as we lose our sight of Christ and our ideas about Christ, even though it's true, faith is a personal union, it's also expressed in propositions. And if I am mistaken about who Christ is, I don't have personal union with the real Christ. If I say I love you, and then I tell you what you're like, and you say, I'm not like that. I'm not really loving you. I'm loving something I've created in my own mind. Again, people today will say, well, don't, don't we all believe in the same Christ, all Christian religions? Well, we don't. My Christ founded a church headed by the Pope. My Christ established seven sacraments. My Christ is a person who drove out the demons. He isn't just a good man somehow identified with God. And my Christ wants to drive out the demons of my life and yours. Now, maybe I'm wrong about the Christ that I believe in. But somebody has to be right. 
Christ can't have established two sacraments or no sacraments or seven sacraments. Somebody has to be right. There has to be a unity of religion. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God, one Father of us all. And we have to strive to experience our unity of faith. And how do we know we have a unity of faith? Well, the Lord established the magisterium of the Pope and the bishops to help us to perceive this. You know, as soon as we lose faith in the Pope and the bishops, it starts to go to pieces. Instead, we have to realize that they're the ones that help us, first of all, to have clear ideas about this, but even more to love him because he wishes to help us to experience unity of character again. So, dear brothers and sisters, today, when we read the gospel of the Gerasene demoniac, let us thank God that we've received, we've been lucky enough, all of us, to receive the faith that we have received. And let us look to him as our one revealer and our one revelation. And by our faith in him, to realize that all those people who all throughout the centuries looked for salvation have only been made perfect in us. When Christ says then, unclean spirit come out of the man, and my name is Legion and we are many, by our perseverance in our moral lives and in the unity of our faith, let us pray that through grace we may constantly experience a greater unity of character, a unity of character in which we reflect the very unity of the Trinity itself.